uh, it's again me be being between you and lunchtime. So let's walk through <coughs> after that introduction on a more global scale. Let's gradually take our walk into fuel cells, uh, fuel cell technology. So we're in a sense looking a little bit on the aspects and challenges in the fuel cells, the aspects of efficiency, we touched that already a little bit, the generation of currents, maybe you will hear m much more about that uh, by the lecture of Claude Lamy tomorrow, and then some initial aspects of heat management in the short summary. Now, <coughs> uh, repeating stuff over and over again sometimes let it, lets it sink into your, uh, into your mind. Fuel cells are electrochemical reactors. And they are multimedia systems. So you've got electrons that leave the fuel cell. You have to feed oxygen, and the fuel cell is taking out part of the, part of the oxygen from... Uh, during the reaction. You feed hydrogen and the fuel cell is consuming part of the hydrogen and in a sense you feed cooling water and the fuel cell is let's say releasing hot, uh, uh, let's say warmer water than before it releases product water. So from that point of view a fuel cell uh, has to be from a chemical engineering point of view regarded as a flow through reactor. Now what uh, I told you the lecture before was not entirely wrong, but keep in mind flow through reactors are working best if they don't consume everything at one turn. So there will be through reactor if you drive into 100% turnover, right? So uh, from that point of view, batteries are pretty simple. They're just electrons in and electrons out. So you're using pretty much excess. And you you are using, you're using excess and you have to manage the excess to a certain extent. And you have to, in, in order to keep the efficiency, the textbook efficiency as close, or the efficiency as close as possible to the textbook, you have to, you have to be aware of that excess and you have to manage that pretty well in order not to waste too much, let's say, in what we call the balance of plant. So, <coughs> in the fuel cell, we have to be aware of reactant supply, we have to be aware of water management, there must be neither too little nor too much, and we have to be aware of heat management. And I guess there will be a, p a special lecture on heat management in fuel cells uh, later in this course. So, <coughs> let's have a look into a PEM fuel cell, into the cell aspect. Well, it has sort of a mem uh, the cell in itself. It has sort of feeding channels for hydrogen and air and oxygen. It has sort of cooling channels, looking like here. And the cell itself, again, is made of a very thin polymer electrolyte membrane, some electrodes, and some uh, diffusion media attached to it. So it's a pretty simple design as compared to an internal combustion engine, no moving parts around. Uh, it can start at low temperature, even at uh, freezing temperature. It can operate up to 80 degrees without, without reasonable problems. Uh, it can sustain fast load changes, provided the amount of media and the amount of fuel and oxygen will change as fast as the load. It's ready for immediate operation and it's an acid electrolyte so it's insensitive to the CO2 of the atmosphere which to a certain extent makes creates some problems in alkaline fuel cells. On the other hand, state-of-the-art PEM fuel cells are a bit on the expensive side, particularly since they are needing expensive noble metal catalysts. Currently, the current state-of-the-art is of the order of 0.4 to 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams of platinum per centimeter square. They are sensitive to fuel and oxidant impurities like carbon monoxide, like ammonia, 
like dust, like oil, like other sulfur-containing uh, <coughs> species. They have a pretty complex water management. They have a re rather low maximum operating temperature, which makes heat management a challenge. And they have a low single cell voltage, which requires electrical series connection. So, <coughs> let's see the fuel cell as an electrochemical reactor. The single cell voltage of a fuel cell is low, <coughs> 0.65 to 0.75 volts. Ask an, an electrical engineer what electrical <coughs> engineers can do with a 0.75 to 0.65 volts. They will typically tell you, well, go home, make your homework, bring me some more voltage, and then we can do business. What is the definition of single cell? One cell. Just one anode, one cathode, <laughs> one, one cell. Like in, a, like in a primary battery, okay. one cell. Okay. So the electrochemical reactions in a fuel cell are taking place at an electrolyte electrode interface and that's where the current is generated. So the current that you can draw from, uh, from a fuel cell is depending on the rate of the electrochemical reactions. The faster they are, the more current you can get out of a certain area of electrode <coughs> electrolyte interface and the more area, the more current. Now ask an electrical engineer what they prefer, current versus voltage, you would, they will tell you voltage. What should I do about, about current? I just need tons of copper to pass current through. Right? So, <coughs> fuel cells, as mentioned, are flow reactors. So reactants are consumed and products are formed along the direction of flow. And fuel cells are not zero dimensional. So they have at least one or maybe two dimensions to be aware of macroscopically. So the reactant concentrations will change along the, uh, along the direction of flow. That has also be to be considered for, let's say, more sophisticated considerations of fuel cells. And the temperature distribution might change along the direction of flow depending on the cooling concept. <coughs> Liquid water will most likely be formed in the flow channel somewhere and there are flooding zones to be expected. Flooding zones means liquid, fuel, uh, liquid water. Flooding zone means less access of gas to the reactant site. Electrons are the reaction products formed during hydrogen oxidation. Electrons are the reactants needed for oxygen reduction. So you have to sort of couple the two of them. And the overall reactant utilization needs to be taken into account. Again, fuel cells are flow reactors. Don't you try to drive a flow reactor into 100% utilization. It's, it's going to be a mess. Right? You can cl come close, but never to 100%. So how do you measure that? We will see that. Now, <coughs> reactant use. Uh, if we consume chemicals and we generate electrons, is there any relation between reactants consumed and electrons generated? And yes, there is. Uh, it's pretty old. It's uh, Michael Faraday somehow figured that out in the 19th century. And there is a proportionality, there is an equivalence of charge and amount of uh, and amount of reactant consumed and the amount of product generated right and so if we consume hydrogen and make protons out of it we generate two electrons per mole so if we let's say run one amp of current <coughs> through a hydrogen electrode then we are using up about 5.18 micromoles of hydrogen, which is about 10.36 micrograms of hydrogen per second, and which turns into a volume flow of something like at atmospheric pressure and standard conditions of about 6.97 milliliters <coughs> per minute. So under atmospheric pressure, you can <coughs> just memorize, under atmospheric pressure, a fuel cell needs at one amp about seven milliliters of hydrogen per minute. 
That's the minimum. If you feed them less, don't you draw one amp out of the fuel cell. Right? Pretty much the same calculation applies to oxygen flow. It's about 2.59 micromoles per second. You need about half mole of oxygen to react it to one mole of water, which turns out into 82.88 micrograms per second, which turns out in, in about 3.5 milliliters per minute of oxygen flow. Water flow. Again, it's 5.18 micromoles per second, <coughs> turning into 93.24 micrograms <coughs> per second, which is the sum of the hydrogen and the oxygen flow, and which turns in, if we, if we get it as a liquid, into 5.59 microliters per minute. Now, you scale the current, you scale the flow. Volume flow, mass flow, whatever flow, right? So Faraday's law is governing quite a bit in fuel cells, and uh, all of you who are not electrochemists remember Faraday's law. And if you're designing a fuel cell, always remember Faraday's law. And never forget Faraday's law. Otherwise, you turn your fuel cell into a mess. It's pretty simple, but you have you have to uh, you have to uh, you have to respect it. And you have to respect it <coughs> on all the active area and all the cells you are feeding. Right? So, reactant supply, hydrogen and oxygen, according to Faraday's law, must be consistent with the current demand. So you can't ask more current than Faraday's law allows and you can't consume more fuel and oxygen than Faraday's law allows. Well, you can you can consume more fuel and oxygen than Faraday's law allows, but this has to be do with leakage and diffusion and all kinds of losses which we might cover later. But at least respect Faraday's law. And respect it in time, for example, during stu steep transients. It's very easy to have a, a millisecond transient uh, in current, but it's very difficult to have a, um, let's say, increase the current by a factor of 10, but it's very difficult to have a gas flow increase by a factor of 10 within milliseconds. Right? Just try it. It's uh, difficult. Be aware. <coughs> if we are operating real fuel cells, like that one, several cells are connected in series electrically con connected in series. And for all those who are not electrical engineers, electrical series connection means the same current flows through every cell. And that means you have to feed every cell the same. So each cell in a row will experience the same current and will have the same need for reactant supply. Now, these electrically series connected fuel cells are typically connected in parallel with respect to reactant supply. So, <coughs> if you connect anything in parallel, most of the flow will go through the path pathway of least resistance. So, from that point of view, <coughs> the design and the manufacturing tolerances must enable equal feeding of each cell. So now you have to you have to look into into the flow distribution of your uh, of your cell design, and you will most probably have a lecture on modeling flow through uh, through cells, which uh, is taking uh, place later in this series if of lectures. Series one goes out. That means uh, you connect to, to disconnect if if there if there is if the all cells are electrically connected in series, yes, and you kill one cell in a hundred in, in a cell row of about a hundred, yeah. you killed the whole stack. Oh boy. That's, yeah, that's that's, uh, that's a tough cookie. cookie yeah. Never, uh, nobody promised you fuel cells being easy. <laughs> They're challenging. <laughs> no, it's not forget it. It's just it's just. Do it, do it right. 
So uh, at <coughs> this point, it imposes tough requirements to the hydraulic homogeneity of the parallel connected cells that you have to be aware of. And uh, also, if you have, let's say, all cells connected in parallel, and you feed them through one channel, the dimensions of that channel must be good enough to feed all cells. You must not come into a, to a situation where the feeding channel limits the feed of gases to your parallel reactor. But least resistance is it like a mechanical resistance or surface it's surface? Let's lay, uh, it's least resistance means if you feed gaseous media, okay. then it's basically the uh, the cell with the, with the lowest <coughs> pressure drop will cool. take most of the flow, right? And the cell with the highest pressure drop will maybe be clogged. And this is uh, this is a challenge concerning if uh, uh, this is a challenge if you uh, are working under what we call condensing conditions. So water droplets will form in the fuel cell, and they have a decent chance to clog individual channels. And so you have to. We come to that later. You have to make sure that the pressure difference between feeding and draining channel is large enough to blow out the droplets, mm. but it's not so large yeah. that you need tremendous amount of energy to, let's say, simply blow all that air and that, all that hydrogen into the cell. You need microfluidic channels. Well, in a sense. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> how much energy can we recover and in which form? This is basically governed by some equations uh, according to uh, Josiah Willard Gibbs, found also in the 19th century. And, well, we learned about the first law of thermodynamics. You must not destroy or create energy. And there is a second law of thermodynamics. Uh, that tells you that heat cannot be converted completely into work. So we need, in a sense, to consider an exchange rate, and we call that exchange rate en entropy. Uh, you will most likely hear more about entropy and energy and so on this afternoon when walking through the thermodynamics. Uh, it's just uh, Josiah Willett Gibbs uh, defined another thermodynamic potential function which we chemists call Gibbs free enthalpy, which some mechanical engineers call exergy. And this is the enthalpy of reaction minus T times delta S. That means that the entropy change during the reaction, reaction. And so this delta G value determines the direction of a chemical reaction. So remember what I said in the first lecture is that supposed to be getting hold, so, uh, hot, right? So if we have uh, Gibbs free enthalpy to re uh, in, a, in a sense that it releases energy to the environment, if the enthalpy of reaction is big enough, if the stuff is getting hold, well we call it an exothermic reaction and typically these <coughs> exothermic reactions they are, let's say, going deliberately from the product from from the from the reactant to the product thing, like, like a combustion. I also told you that some, this is more physical, some reactions go the other way around. Uh, like they, is that supposed to be getting cold, right? So if we dissolve a salt into liquid, we might have a situation where the enthalpy of reaction. Uh, we need to supply heat to dissolve the salt, to drive the enthalpy. But entropy drives the overall process, right? So although the solution is getting colder, so thermal energy is consumed from the environment, the overall process of dissolving the salt is spontaneous. Gibbs free enthalpy is still negative, right? So Gibbs free enthalpy drives you, shows you the direction of, of reaction. That's very important to know. So in that case, how can we get hold of entropy of reaction? Well, entropy is, is a very strange concept, like energy. Some people from a statistical point of view 
associates entropy with the state of order or disorder. Uh, to be to be more precise, entropy uh, states of high entropy. Then you have a multitude of possibilities how a system could look the same. So if you look at my desk, which is pretty messy, uh, and I would turn one pencil another way around, you wouldn't notice the difference. So there are many ways how my messy desk could look the same. So it's of high entropy. Now if you look at my boss's desk, which is pretty well ordered and where all the pencils are in line and all, let's say all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed, then if one pencil has the other way around, you would certainly notice. And so there are only very few states where this desk looks the same. So that's the, let's say, more, stati more uh, appropriate statistical way of looking at entropy. How many ways do we have that a system could look the same? So if we translate that into uh, chemical reactions, now hydrogen oxidation. Hydrogen plus oxygen gives water. If we balance the left side, we have hydrogen plus half a molecule of oxygen. We've got 18 mass units. That's fine. If we balance the right side, H2O, water, it also corresponds to 18 mass units. So the conservation of mass in that equation is fulfilled. Engineers are happy. Right? If we count the number, the number of hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms, left and right, they are the same. So chemists are happy. Now, if we start to count the number of species on the left side, then we find that the left side, hydrogen plus half a mole of oxygen, adds up to one and a half moles. On the right side, water, it's one mole. So the head count on either side is different. That means if we add up the sums of moles to onto the left side and the right side, and we subtract the sums of moles of the left side from the right side, the reactants from the products, we get to a number change of minus 0.5 mole per reaction. And if we if we assume gaseous reaction products uh, and conditions of constant pressure, then we will experience that the system will shrink. It will use less volume, right? So remember that messy and that ordered desk. If you've got less volume and if you've got more volume, if you've got the less species and more species, you can create less or more chaos, less or more states of equal distribution, which look the same. So there is entropy change involved, right? And we can relate the change of entropy with the change of gaseous species involved in a chemical reaction. And so if you look at this reaction, we find there is we're missing species at the red a number of species at the right side. And so we'll find that delta G is less than delta H. Gibbs free enthalpy is less than the overall ent uh, entropy. If we look at this reaction, methane oxidation, remember the blue curve? You'll see it again. Don't need to, no need to stress your memory. Here the number change is zero. And so we expect delta G to be almost equal delta H. And if we look at that strange reaction, solid carbon with half a mole of oxygen turns into carbon monoxide, we will see that num uh, the change of gaseous molecules in that crude approximation, you can forget about condensed phases, liquid water or, or, or solid carbon. Uh, then there is plus 0.5, and so Gibbs free enthalpy would be larger than delta H. And in that respect, we would expect, uh, we could expect an efficiency of that process electrochemically f uh, of more than 100%. Perfectly in line with the law of conservation of energy. We're just taking the environment into account and harvesting energy from the environment into our system. So fuel cells might, to a certain extent, be a challenge to, uh, let's say, an engineer's mind. They're also a challenge to the chemist's mind, but in any way. So 
we although in that with that definition we could expect more than a hundred percent efficiency we still observing the law of conservation of energy you remember that right. almost independent of temperature that's the that's a consequence of that and conserving cons conservation of energy we need to transfer some heat from the fuel cell into that reaction to come to, uh, to come to that okay now uh, we are looking we when we are talking about when we chemists are talking about energy we're talking about some kilojoules per mole which is a strange concept to any engineer right if they would call about kilojoules <coughs> per mass that's okay now uh, let's do a favor to the electrical engineers uh, <coughs> if we're looking at so, uh, at enthalpy, at Gibbs free enthalpy, at entropy, and so on. These are what we call thermodynamic potential functions. And if there is a thermodynamic potential, some we've heard about electric potential. Is there a way of relating the thermodynamic potential function to some electric units? And yes, there is. So if we take the energy the free energy of reaction delta G <coughs> it's the maximum that we can get out of a uh, of an electrochemical reaction of an electrical reaction then we can correlate it with the charge times sort of a voltage a driving force charge times driving force is energy charge times voltage is energy Gibbs free enthalpy is energy so then if we remember Faraday's law that the amount of charge exchanged during a reaction is somehow related to the number of moles consumed or generated in a reaction times the number of electrons exchanged during that reaction times some strange constant which we call the charge of one mole of electrons Faraday's constant 96,485 uh, coulombs per mole then we, we can express the molar Gibbs free enthalpy, therefore we use the lowercase letter, as minus Z, the number of electrons exchanged, times Faraday's constant, times <coughs> potential difference, times voltage of the reaction. And we can express delta G by dividing it by Z times F, and adding a minus to it to a voltage difference to a, volta uh, to a voltage so this relates remember the chemical energy given in kilojoules per mole to a theoretically expected voltage of an electrochemical cell this very simple equation and so we can express Gibbs free reaction uh, enthalpy of reaction as the maximum voltage we can expect from an electrochemical reaction right so taking this to in, into account that the maximum energy we can get out of an, out of an electrochemical reaction Gibbs free enthalpy can be related to a voltage then we can also in a sense uh, correlate the operating voltage of a fuel cell to the uh, to the fuel cell efficiency. So in our efficiency term here, we just said replace delta G by its voltage equivalent and delta H, which is also in units of kilojoules per mole, by its voltage equivalent. Now we've got the maximum the maximum possible and if we replace here delta G by the operating voltage then we get the real efficiency conversion efficiency so lucky for the electrical engineers all the units you can measure voltages that's perfect 
you can relate it to fuel cell efficiency. Very easy. You just have to convert the reaction enthalpy into electrical terms, into voltage terms. Now, <coughs> electrochemical reactions, it's a very crude approach and Claude will tell you much more about it later. If we bring a reactant, let's call it hydrogen, into contact with an inert catalytically active surface, let's call it platinum, in the presence of an electrolyte, then we can imagine electrolyte, let's call it sulfuric acid. So there are protons, there is hydrogen, there is an electrolyte where protons are dissolved, and there is a source in the sink of electrons. So we can imagine that a couple of reactions can take place. So hydrogen can interact with the so surface and produce protons and electrons. Protons from the solution can interact with electrons in the electrodes to produce hydrogen. And so there is a back and forth of these possible reactions. And we call it equilibrium if the rate of reaction 1 is equal to rate of reaction 2. If the same amount of species is going into one direction as it is going to the back, back reaction. Uh, pretty much if you look into, let's say, a crowded room, dozens of people floating all around the room, two doors, one is open, one is, uh, uh, the other one is open, people entering the room, people leaving the room, and if the overall number of people entering the room is equal to the number of people leaving the room, we call, let's say, the filling state of this room in equilibrium. Now, <coughs> we can expect that the amount of electrons in the platinum will be different after this equilibrium takes place from the initial state. And so we can expect that the electrode will adopt a certain potential, which is corresponding to this reaction somehow. Remember, we can relate voltages, potentials, electrical potentials, to chemical reactions, free enthalpy. And so we can also imagine that the potential will vary with temperature, with pressure, with the concentration of the species involved, like the protons and so on. So these are parameters of the potential formation. If we look at that from a solid state physics point of view, we have, let's say, a metal like platinum. We have a certain amount of uh, electrons in that platinum. And let's say the topmost energy of that, those electrons in the platinum, we call the Fermi level, uh, is somewhere here. We have the opportunity of a chemical reaction taking place in the electrolyte involving electrons, protons, and hydrogen. And let's say this level is somehow here. So in this case, uh, the amount of electrons in the electrode, the energy of electrons in the electrode is higher than the energy of the reacting species in the electrolyte. So we can expect electrons to flow from the electrode into the re uh, into the reacting species. And we will find equilibrium as soon as the energy, as the ele uh, sufficient electrons are flown into the reacting species. This is the situation at the oxygen electrode at the cathode, where we take pick up electrons. Now if we look at the other side, we have the same original energy in a sense uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the energy of the Fermi level here, and we have some more energy, uh, some more energy in the uh, in the electrolyte system. So energies, uh, electrons are flowing into the into the platinum, raising the energy level here to equilibrium, and so here the electrode will form a more positive potential than originally. Here it will form a more negative potential. Remember this cartoon at the beginning, right? So we can express this situation also in terms of solid state physics. And if we can express, let's say, one situation in, let's say, two 
different scientific disciplines, it might be a good approach to do that. So we can <coughs> we can we can look at that. And now, well, we have to somehow find a measure for electrode potentials. All electrical engineers are aware that there is no way of measuring a single potential. All chemists are aware that aware there is no way of measuring the absolute value of enthalpy, internal energy, and also the mechanical engineers believe that. The absolute value. So we have to, all we can measure is our differences. So now there are different approaches how to measure potential differences. Typically electrical engineers uh, are a bit on, on the crude side in defining zero potential. They just take a pole, ram it into the ground, and tell well that's zero. Right? Now Physicists are a bit more elaborate. <coughs> uh, physicists take an electron, transport it through the universe at the ed end of the universe, and tell, well, there is zero. Electrochemists uh, are a bit more grounded than physicists, uh, but not that well grounded than, in, than, in, uh, than electrical engineers. So electrochemists are well aware that the pole in the ground might corrode, and that's an electrochemical process, so it's no good for zero, right? In any case, uh, electrochemical uh, electrochemists typically use the hydrogen reaction, hydrogen to protons and electrons, at the interface, at an inert interface, under standard conditions, at a temperature of 298.15 Kelvin, at a pressure of 1013 millibar, at a hydrogen activity of 1 and a proton activity of 1 mole per liter as their point of zero refer uh, of zero. That's what we call the standard hydrogen electrode. And all electrochemists reference any potential that you are might be aware of with respect to this reaction, to zero. This potential will change with pH, so you will find a decreasing hydrogen potential with respect to the standard as you increase pH, as you go from acid to alkaline. You will also in, uh, you will find that the oxygen potential is 1.23 volts more positive than the hydrogen reaction. And also this potential will change with pH. But the difference between hydrogen and oxygen potential will stay the same all over, all values of pH. So in some case, electrochemists turn their world, uh, twist their world a little bit and reference in the same electrolyte their potential with respect to the hydrogen potential in a given electrolyte and we call that RHE reference hydrogen electrode and we call this if the pH of the solution is zero one mole per liter in protons then we call it SHE standard hydrogen electrode so these two re terms of references you have to be uh, to keep in mind standard means acidic pH and reference means any pH, but the same at the hydrogen and the oxygen electrodes. So, <coughs> so far what we did is we let nature do their trick and have, let's say, nature establish an equilibrium. Equilibrium means nothing changes. Equilibria are boring. So if nothing change, changes, no engineering, no chemistry, no electrical engineering, nothing change. It's bo changes, it's boring, simply. So if something has got to change and we want to have a fuel cell generate current, we somehow have to push electrons around macroscopically. And this means if we push electrons around, we have to establish a driving force. And the driving force in electrochemistry is associated with the electrical potential difference between the equilibrium state 
and the state of observation. So pushing electrons across an interface will meet resistance. You can do very elaborate map models on it, but keep in mind pushing electrodes, electrons around, uh, across an electrochemical interface will meet resistance. And we can describe that somehow. We will see that, uh, you, you will see that if you push electrons through a uh, rod of metal, you will see a linear current voltage curve. We call it Ohm's law. If you push electrons through an electrochemical interface, you will see a curved current voltage curve. So something nonlinear is happening. If we measure the potential difference between two probes in the electrolyte, we will see the electrolyte is pretty ohmic. It will have a linear relation between current and voltage. It has a resistivity, as we as every uh, real material has. So this nonlinearity has to do something with, let's say, pushing electrons across the interface. Now, <coughs> remember we have uh, we, we said that we established the potential at an interface by having a dynamic equilibrium. So and so many reactions going this way and the same amount is going the other way around. Now we have to come to, we have to, come to another concept in chemistry, the, let's say, activation of a reaction. So no chemical reaction, although it might occur spontaneously or might seem to occur spontaneously, really goes without any let's say, activation. That's like you. Think about yourself in the morning, lying in bed. Some of you with a hangover. Some of you have sl uh, haven't slept right. Some of, some of you it was too hot. Some of you it was too cold. In any case, uh, <coughs> in order to get out of bed, there must be sort of, you, you have to overcome some internal resistance. You have to motivate yourself. Either there is an urge to go to the washroom or there is a need for coffee or whatever. So it needs some pulling yourself together and get moving. And well, you're made of atoms, so why should chemical reactions act any different than you? So in order for a chemical system to react, it needs to overcome a barrier. If you look at materials, they typically are at the bottom of a, let's say, so we, we call it stability or the, the bottom of a potential surface. No? They are pretty much in equilibrium with themselves and in order to overcome that, they need to move, they need to pick up some energy and then they reach a state where they, uh, where they call, uh, which we call activated complex. It's maybe the same state you reach when you sit at the edge of your bed and decide, well, it's time to sleep for, uh, for another five minutes and drop back. Or it's time to, uh, to get up. You choose that way. So the activated complex, your 50% chance of going backwards and forwards. And if there is sufficient, re uh, sufficient activation enthalpy, then the reactants overcome the state of the activated complex and react and get to a state of lower energy, which in a sense is the turn of, an, uh, of each chemical reaction, reach a, a state of lower energy. Right? So, take home message. Each chemical reactions need to be activated. And the height of the activation barrier is different for each chemical reaction. It's different from, uh, for hydrogen, it's different for oxygen. And it's good that, let's say, there is an activation barrier. Since if there were no activation barrier for chemical reactions, we wouldn't be here. We would all be in our perfect equilibrium thermodynamic state, which is CO2 and water. 
So bless the activation barrier. Don't curse it. Right? Now, <coughs> how to deal with activation barriers? This has been done by Svante Arrhenius, and he found that, let's say, the rate of a chemical reaction is somehow related to a factor, we call it the pre-exponential factor, times an exponential of activation energy divided by R and T, individual ga uh, universal gas constant and temperature. So in a sense, activation is overcome by temperature. The higher the temperatures, the more energy is in the reacting system, and the more, in a sense, the rate of reaction goes on. And so there is, let's say, a rule of thumb from that, uh, from that Arrhenius equation that raising the temperature by 10 Kelvin will double the, rea uh, the reaction rate, typically. You, would, you can observe that in, in, many, in, in, in many instances. You can observe that in the lifetime of uh, semiconductors being operated at higher or lower temperature. So if you operate a certain semiconductor at, let's say, 10 degrees above, uh, its ordinary operating temperature, it will age a factor of two faster. Right? So, <coughs> in a sense, the chemical equilibrium is, in a, uh, is, then is established then when the same rate goes forward and backward. Now, we can influence the, let's say, situation of these potential by superimposing an electrical potential from the outside. There might, there's an electrochemicals magician trick how to superimpose a, a potential from the outside. And so we can shift those potentials. And by superimposing, in a sense, a potential from the outside, we can shift the equilibrium, right? So again, in equilibrium, there is the same amount of reactions going forward and backward. Now, <coughs> if we superimpose different potentials, we can induce a current and if you uh, superimpose more and more potential, Claude will discuss that in much more detail, we can record something like a current voltage curve. Right? And the potential, so to speak, moves the relative state of the, initial, uh, of the final state with respect to, let's say, an undisturbed state. And <coughs> Doing all, the, doing all the mathematical tricks to these, let's say, kinetic equations, we end up with the simple form of a current voltage curve of a single elementary process in, a <coughs> in electrochemical reactions. And it's let, like the, the current as a function of deviation of potential from equilibrium is something like uh, sort of what we call an exchange current density times uh, the rate of the forward reaction and since if we are changing potential we are also changing the rate of the backward reaction so it's exchange current density times the difference between the rate of the forward and the backward reaction right? and if we plot that look at the green curve Equilibrium, zero current. If we increase the potential, we are driving, let's say, this reaction more than that. And if we decrease the potential, we are driving that reaction more than this. But both reactions are taking place at equilibrium and even to higher devia to deviations from equilibrium. <coughs> At a certain point, we can neglect, let's say, the influence of the backward reaction as compared to the forward reaction, or the forward reaction as compared to the backward reaction. But around equilibrium, we have, we have to consider them both. And now we can analyze such a current voltage curve. 
if we look very close to the equilibrium potential, we will see an almost linear relationship. Now I have to... I was, I was talking about different languages in different, ter in different disciplines and so on, uh, so I now will tell you, this is the essence of science. You know what the essence of science is? You find an equation and you modify it in a way that it will become linear. So finding a linear relation is the essence of science. right? And so if you look at this equation, uh, if you look at this part of the curve, it's pretty linear. So you have to mess around with this equation to turn it linear. And so you play the very, the, the, the very same trick as in other disciplines of thermodynamics. You expand it into a, uh, into a Taylor series and truncate it after the first term, and you end up here. So at very slow devia low deviations from the equilibrium potential, the current voltage curve turns linear, and you can extract this parameter, the J0, the uh, exchange current density from it. Now, there's another way of turning the thing linear. It's at larger deviations from, uh, from equilibrium potential, where you can neglect the influence of the other reaction. Then, for example, when we are when we are going to when we increase the potential, electrochemists uh, say we are going anodic. We can neglect the influence of the cathodic part of the uh, of the overall current voltage uh, curve, and then if we put a logarithm to either side, we will find that we can simplify the equation that the logarithm of the current, as a function of deviation from equilibrium, is the logarithm of J naught times some strange factor consisting of sort of an alpha times z times f. Alpha we call the symmetry factor. It has to do with the symmetry of the activation barrier, and I'm pretty sure Claude will tell you more about that, times the deviation from, from potential. So again, a linear relationship. This linear relationship has been found empirically a long time ago by Julius Tafel, and therefore it's also called the Tafel approximation or the Tafel plot. So if you read something like Tafel plot or Tafel uh, slope and so on, remember it's a linearization of the current voltage curve. And the Tafel slope, in a sense, gives you a parameter alpha times z, so it has information about the symmetry of the activation energy and the number of exchanged electrons. That's the essence of the Tafel slope. And the intersection with the <coughs> uh, at, at zero uh, over potential, that gives you information on the exchange current density. And remember, this Tafel equation is only valid for elementary reactions. If you've got a complicated system, it might be a bit of a difficulty to find a uh, linear relation empirically. Now, if we modify the symmetry factor, you see that all of a sudden the anodic, uh, the cathodic and the anodic Tafel slow, or the anodic current voltage curve uh, becomes different. If we vary the exchange current density, you see that it's pr uh, at, the, uh, at the same symmetry factor, you will see that the reaction turns out to be more or the current turns to be more to be more or less sensitive to the uh, to, uh, to the deviation of uh, equilibrium potential. So, if we find a large value of this exchange current density J naught, then we typically have a fast reaction. And if we f if we find it uh, if we find no difference in the anodic and the cathodic part uh, of the current voltage curve, then we have a symmetric reaction. And so the fast stuff, that's what we typically find in hydrogen, hydrogen oxidation and reduction. And the slow stuff, that's something we find typically in oxygen reduction and, ox uh, and, and oxidation. And, so, and also we find a, quite a bit of asymmetry in the oxygen reaction. So <coughs> basically, fuel cell researchers are mainly concerned with making the cathodic reaction happen. 
the anaerobic re reaction is, let's say, of less uh, trouble. So in a sense, in an electrochemical cell, we have to push this reaction to an anodic direction, hydrogen oxidation, and this reaction to a cathodic direction, oxygen reduction, right? So we have charge transfer here and there, proton movement here, electron movement there. And this, uh, as you can see, if we want to run current, we will see a deviation, if we run a certain current, we will see a deviation from the original potential at the left side and at the right side. Now, if we push an anodic current through the cell, then, let's say, the hydrogen oxidation rea reaction deviates a few millivolts from its equilibrium part. However, if we push the cathodic reaction at the other side, it will deviate considerably. And the same amount of current in, has to flow from the, an, uh, from the anode as for the cathode. So we're looking at a given current for the potential of the anode and the cathode. And the potential difference between cathode and anode will give us the cell voltage. Well, at least part of the cell voltage. So we're losing a little bit of voltage at the anode side, and we're losing considerably at the cathode side. We've got that, that stuff here, the electrolyte. This has some internal resistance. We've got the electrodes. They have some electronic resistance. So we are also losing a bit of voltage by voltage drop through the electrolyte and through the electrodes. And one more. You might have uh, heard that we are using platinum at the anode and we are using platinum at the cathode. So we're using an inert catalyst at either side of the, uh, of the cell. That means the platinum is a catalyst that catalyzes almost everything. So it facilitates reactions. So it will <coughs> if we put, let's say, pure oxygen to the cathode, it will facilitate the oxygen reduction. If we put pure hydrogen to the anode, it will facilitate only the anode reaction. But if we simultaneously put hydrogen and oxygen to one electrode, the catalyst will facilitate one reaction and the other. And so the well, electrode has somehow to decide which potential it's going to adopt. And the potential that's going to be adopted by the electrode is what we call a mixed potential. It's a mixture between the zero volts we are expecting from the hydrogen side and the 1.23 volts we are expecting from the oxygen side. And so the ratio between is somehow related to the exchange current densities. So you can imagine that traces of hydrogen that are moving through the electrolyte from the anode to the cathode side will pull down the cathode potential since the reaction is fast and reversible. You will also expect that traces of oxygen which go through the electrolyte from the cathode side to the anode side will not very much affect the anode potential. <coughs> so what you typically see in a real working fuel cell is a lot of mixed potential at the cathode side and mainly the pure hydrogen potential at the anode side. But never forget, there's an electrolyte in between and this electrolyte should be blocking for the reactants but isn't completely. You will see that later. Is that the reason you get 0 0.6? No, the, the, the 0 0.65 volt is due to current. current. That's the 0 0.65 uh, volt is due to, well, we pass a certain amount of current. We're going along this current voltage curve on the cathode side, and we're going along this current voltage curve on the anode side. So, now I told you, uh, you can kill a fuel cell pretty much if you don't feed it appropriately. Uh, 
you can understand that from, from this point of view. You drive a certain anodic current through the, through the anode. If uh, there is no oxygen to be, uh, to be reduced, you need somehow a similar amount of current, cathodic current, going through the cathode. And so, in that case, you're going, uh, you're doing, so to speak, an excursion of the hydrogen pot uh, potential voltage, uh, uh, current voltage curve. And so, you're instead of reducing oxygen at the cathode side, you're producing hydrogen at the cathode side, and you're getting into a situation of what we call cell reversal, right? Producing, producing and consuming hydrogen are very reversible reactions, and so if you starve a fuel cell on the oxidant side, on the air side, it's not all that bad. You're just producing a little bit of hydrogen which, which goes into the cathode and leaves the fuel cell. It's not doing damage to the fuel cell itself. However, if you starve it on the anode side, then pushing current through the fuel cell, being part of an electrical series connected stack, means that the anode will still stay an anode and will still have to drive an anodic reaction. And now the question is what, what happens at the anodic reaction, as in, uh, as in substitute anodic reaction. And it will be either corrosion of carbon support, of, of electrode, it could be evolution of oxygen, it could be everything. And typically the first reaction to occur is the corrosion of the catalyst. So if you starve a fuel cell on the fuel side, you will pretty soon start to corrode the catalyst and you will pretty soon kill the fuel cell. Keep that in mind. Too little air, we generate a little bit of, oxygen, uh, of hydrogen at the cathode side, mm, well, no real harm. If we have too little, uh, if we have too little fuel at the, at the anode side, uh, we will still have to drive an anodic reaction and we can do that by dissolving platinum, by corroding carbon or by evolving oxygen. And corroding carbon is on a potential scale the next likely reaction. So, we have some additional processes in the fuel cell and they, have, they are associated to transport processes. So we have to transport reactants to the side of reaction and products from the side of reaction. And we typically do that through so-called porous media. So the reaction takes place at the electrolyte electrode interface and in between there are some porous media we call gas diffusion layers where oxygen has to diffuse that way, water has to diffuse that way and where there is sometimes some nitrogen which is diffusing either way and where the electrons have to go through. So this diffusion layer, in a sense, needs to be conductive for electrons and highly porous uh, to transport gases and quite hydrophobic not to get flooded by the water. Porous. Highly porous? Hydrophobic. hydrophobic not to get flooded by the water that's generated in the fuel cell. And so you can, in a sense, have these transport processes, protons, to the interface, and then you're reacting in a sense. The, uh, you're, rea you're reacting uh, the protons here, generate water, and water has to go out, and oxygen has to go in. In that respect, so you you're building up a concentration of water close at the close to the interface, which is going down through the gas diffusion layer to the outside world. You have a certain concentration of oxygen here which is depleted at the interface at the, during the, in the gas, the gas diffusion layer to the interface. So the reactants deplete and the product increases along the, across the GDL and along the flow channels. 
You can describe these diffusion processes by ordinary fixed law. Uh, if you're doing more sophisticated stuff, particularly in the catalyst, in the region close to the catalyst, you will find the pores being, let's say, in size compatible with the diffusion, uh, with the uh, average uh, pathway of the diffusing particles. So you might resort to Knudsen's law, and you can do lots of arithmetics and lots of mathematics in terms of describing this diffusion by either uh, fixed law or by Knudsen's law. However, what you will find is that if you're driving current faster and faster and more and more and more, you will somehow decrease the concentration of the reactant at the interface. And eventually, you will come to a situation where the, co where the concentration at the, uh, each species that reaches the interface is immediately reacted. So the concentration of reactants at the interface is zero. <laughs> and at that point, you can increase the driving force as much as you like. You won't get more current out of it. right? And so we are coming to a situation where we have, so to speak, a limiting current. The current that you can draw from the fuel cell is limited by the mass transport across the gas diffusion layer to the reacting interface. Well, why do, why do we need a uh, gas diffusion layer at all? There is oxygen. There is oxygen. There you have, so to speak, a contact area where you pick up the current. right? So oxygen from here needs to go under there. So we need sort of a porous interface from the solid current collector to the solid polymer electrolyte. We need that. Right? And so if we analyze the current voltage curve, we will see some losses associated to electrolyte resistance, some to electronic resistance in the electrode, some pretty steep loss by the irreversibility of the oxygen reduction. I'm sure Claude will tell you more about that. Some minor loss according to the kinetic losses at the, at the anode and some losses due to mass transport in the high current density region. And so we can, in a sense, visualize a fuel cell as a sequence of functional layers. Let's start in the middle, the electrolyte. The electrolyte transports charged species like protons, and it blocks electrons. We have the catalyst layer at the hydrogen side, at the oxygen side, at the anode side, at the cathode side. In the catalyst layers, there the electrochemical reactions take place. And then we've got the gas diffusion layers. The gas diffusion layers, in a sense, homogenize the reactant supply and the product removal from the catalyst layer from the interface. Then we have the gas distribution layer. There we have flow channels. So we are pushing air and hydrogen and water through those flow channels. And then we've got the current collectors. We've got some area of cooling. And then we start repeating these layers in a fuel cell stack. Right? Single cell. Let's say sectorized in different functional layers. Here we are talking about nanostructures, nano, nano dimensions of, let's say, pores. They are filled with water and protons and stuff. Here we are talking nanostructure to microstructure in the catalyst layer. Here we are talking about micrometers in the gas diffusion layer. And here we are talking about hundreds of micrometers to millimeters in the gas distribution layer. Now, <clears throat> remember all losses we were talking about, pushing electrons through interfaces, pushing protons through electrolytes, pushing electrons through electronic conductors, they are contributing to heat release from the fuel cell. And so at a first glance, most of the losses can be expressed in voltages. The entropy term 
lowers the open circuit voltage. Delta G corresponds to, let's say, 1.23 volts. Delta H would be 1.4 volt. Kinetic losses at the, at the anodes will contribute to, let's say, a voltage loss. Typically, that's very low. Kinetic losses at the cathode, typically that's very high, will contribute to a voltage loss. The ohmic resistance, I times R, will contribute to a voltage loss. And so, uh, and last but not least, the mass transport phenomena will, contra uh, will translate into a voltage loss. So in a sense, all that voltage at a given current that's lost will contribute to the heat release in the fuel cell. And so that heat needs to be taken out of the fuel cell, either by a coolant circuit, by evaporation of product water, by heat conduction and radiation from the cell edges, and so on. So, we've talked about the fuel cell as an electrochemical reactor so far. Now, we realize it's an electrochemical flow reactor and a heat exchanger. Right? So, we were talking about that one, the fuel cell. When looking at the overall system, we have to supply the system with fuel and oxidant. We have to take the current and make something out of it. Uh, like, we need some power electronics to convert the current in something useful. No electrical engineers like, like a current voltage curve like this. You won't, you, won't feed, you won't feed any application with a current voltage curve like this. So you have to do some, something about it. And this typically is either a DC-DC converter or a DC to AC converter or whatsoever. Matching the impedance of the fuel cells to the impedance of the appliance. Right? And it's a, particular, it's a particular headache to match the capacitively dominated impedance of a fuel cell to the inductively dominated impedance of a motor. So that's a particular, that's a particular nuisance uh, in terms of feeding right. Remember, if you start a motor, you've got a lot of current just getting into the motor. And you've got the tiny little fuel cell with that little capacitance to feed it. And you've got Faraday's law working against you. So you have to do something about that. Right? Okay. So, fuel cell, fuel supply, electricity supply, heat management, water management. These are the issues that we're talking about when we're designing fuel cell systems and fuel cell stacks and so on and so on. Again, fuel cells are electrochemical flow reactors and they are heat exchangers. The current produced in a fuel cell is proportional to the amount of reactants consumed and, to be honest, to the amount of product generated, particularly water. Appropriate feeding of the fuel cell is essential in time and across all the active area. The theoretical voltage is determined by Gibbs free enthalpy, so by thermodynamic laws. You can't fight it. In practical, the operating voltage is also influenced by the formation of mixed potentials, like crossing over fuel to the oxidant side and so on. Losses by pushing electrons across a phase boundary, the electrode to the electrolyte. Losses by limited reactant supply, remember that mass transport stuff. And losses due to internal resistances, that means electrolyte resistance and electrode resistance. All those losses are turned into heat which need to be removed from the fuel cell and when the fuel cell is not operated under conditions of 100% reactant utilization we will have additional losses which are due to let's say surplus oxidant that's supplied we have to compress air and push it through or some hydrogen that's just floating away or needs to be recycled by a pump that also costs some, uh, some energy. So the, these issues, they have to be dealt on a system level and will, let's say, be extra challenges to the system engineer. Pretty much the same as making decent current out of the fuel cell current voltage curve. Thank you.
Sure.